He had already gone to the wet plate photography that you saw Matthew Brady's photography of the Civil War to now dry plate photography which was being introduced in the, eight, in the late 1870s and early 1880s which really uh, was a, a, a leap in the technology. He scoffed this, this French <coughs> ne'er-do-well entomologist. <laughs> you, might, you might find that I have a little negative feeling about this guy. I, I don't know. I try to be, I try to be fair, but it's difficult because I've seen his handiwork and I'm not talking about his paintings. <clears throat> he scoffed at the notions that cameras could ever replace the human eye. He said that versatile organ, the eye, he said, could adapt to nuances of varying light conditions and capture minute details a, photo, a photographic plate would always miss. He was wrong in some respects. In some respects, he was right because, uh, in fact, um, Bob Horton and I were discussing this today. We were looking, or we were over, uh, <clears throat> we, were, we were looking at some, um, some of the, uh, the early uh, chromolithographs over at LAD uh, Observatory, and there's, there's a quality in these illustrations that a photograph could not reproduce. There's a certain softness. You certainly don't have anything tacky sharp in any of these things the way you do in a photograph, but you have a mood, you have a color that only an artist could have re recreated. So he actually set to work employing telescopes from 6 inches in aperture to 26 inches. These were the tools he figured he needed to magnify and extend his view of the heavens. And this is how he did it. This was his technique. <clears throat> he ensured correct proportions in his drawings by using a ground glass plate with an incised network of squares, kind of like a reticle, if you will. He fixed this reticle to the tailpiece of the instrument at the prime focus. And then what he could do, he had a corresponding sheet of paper with squares gridded on it that equaled what he saw on the glass plate at the tailpiece of the instrument at prime focus. And then what he would do, he would just take one square at a time and he would draw it as he saw it in the reticle on the paper. This guy had a lot of patience. He first sketched in pencil <clears throat> and then uh, he finally went to his final drawing. Now, he using this technique uh, Truvelo, <clears throat> he began using the technique at Harvard, actually, and then he was invited to go to Washington and use <clears throat> the Great Equatorial, the 26-inch Great Equatorial in Washington at the old Naval Observatory. Uh, <clears throat> and he used that Great Equatorial to great, uh, to great advantage. He first sketched in pencil, and one of the ones he did, of course, I don't have it in the right order here, but this is Jupiter and pardon the a little typo there, I just noticed that earlier. Um, <clears throat> this was done through the Harvard Observatory just prior to him going to Washington. He sketched in pencil and then he, he would go first to, uh, he would go to the Nautical Almanac and he'd find the information that he needed from the Nautical Almanac and then he would go to the telescope and then he would fill in the details of what he saw. And then from there he would add detail and he w the next generation was a pastel drawing. Uh, drawn double the scale of what he could see in the instrument. The diameter of the planet actually measured on his square about 10 inches in diameter. <clears throat> he also produced... Here's his Saturn. Whoa, inky division. Oh, you can see the Cassini division there, very nicely done. Yeah, but he became very precise in these things. In fact, there were a lot of people, <clears throat> there were a lot of folks who saw his work, they marveled at the accuracy of it. Some people were somewhat skeptical. They said, well, how accurate could the human eye be? Yeah. So what happened was he, uh, he invited uh, the Naval Observatory's uh, uh, leading astronomer at the time, Edward Holden, to test the accuracy of some star positions that he had done. And Edward Holden found that they were probably the errors were about six seconds of arc in error in position which translated to about one twentieth of an inch on the finished product. So these were very very accurate. For the next several years he worked on seven thousand drawings using this technique both at Harvard and elsewhere not just the Naval Observatory but other uh, institutions that invited him to come as kind of a guest astronomer if you will. He finally <clears throat> called these views to fifteen just 15 views. 
the best of all of them, 15 best. Several of these pastels were completed by 1876 and they were actually hung as part of the Naval Observatory's exhibit at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. Yet, <clears throat> Trouvelo was not satisfied with his limited audience. He determined that his work should reach a much larger audience. Now, you see, he's moving from the belief that these were merely for scientists to more general public, people interested in astronomy who might not be professional scientists. And so he contracted with the publishing house of Charles Scribner's Sons in New York, one of the largest houses in New York, to present his 15-plate set as a set of lithographs. Each plate would measure 27 by 37 inches. And he chose the actual <clears throat> chromo, it's called the chromolithographic process, and he even supervised the preparation of the plates himself. He was a, he was a perfectionist. The job was completed in 1881, and each set accompanied by a manual describing how the drawings and the, the final print was made. In combination of these, uh, he sold them for $125. Ah, this one right there. <clears throat> Zodiacal the light. Bring it up, John. Yeah, bring it up here. Check it, up. check it out on the way out. Maybe that's the best thing. Okay. Whatever, you, whatever you want. Hmm. I was just looking to replace you. Well, there's a it table here. You can lay it flat. <coughs> you you lay, lay, lay it on the table here. I guess the building here, back okay. here, would be a good spot. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, the set, <clears throat> the completed set of those 15, that size that you just saw, and the manual sold for $125. Hmm. Now that seems today insignificant, but back in 1881, 125 bucks was a considerable amount of money. A thousand or ten thousand? Yeah, about the equivalent of about, yeah, about, about ten thousand dollars. God, yeah. and he got it. So it was, uh, it was a considerable amount of money. So your average citizen did not go out and buy 15 of these things at a, at a clip. <coughs> He actually won the French Academy. The French Academy had a prize every year for uh, naturalist paintings. It was called the Valls Prize, and he won it uh, in 1876 for this project that he had done. He also had a fascination with the sun. He loved looking at solar eclipses. In fact, you may recognize this, the famous solar eclipse. Actually, the date is wrong there. It says 1875. It should be 1878. Yeah. Hmm. He had this passion about the sun for the rest of his life, really. Uh, he seldom did he miss an opportunity to witness, to witness a solar eclipse. He, um, <clears throat> he found out, he knew in advance, you know, checking it out where the, where the solar eclipses would take place in the United States, and he would find a way to get there in time. A rare chance to observe a real solar eclipse, which would have been a total solar eclipse, occurred in uh, July of 1878 when he and his son traveled to Wyoming Territory, Creston, Wyoming, where it could be best seen. That was going to be along the path of the eclipse. And on the way, <coughs> excuse me, on the way out to Wyoming Territory, um, he met up with a group uh, <coughs> from the U.S. Naval Observatory. It's interesting. I don't know how many of you have studied the solar eclipse of 1878. But it was a major occurrence in the United States. The path, <clears throat> the path of the eclipse started around the Gulf of Mexico, worked its way through Texas, New Mexico, up through Colorado, through Wyoming Territory, and then up into Canada, through a part of Montana, up into Canada. And the U.S. Army under General Sherman actually protected a lot of the astronomers from Indian attacks, because this was the time when the Indian Wars were underway out in the West. So the Naval Observatory team went out there to, to cover this eclipse in several locations. One of them, one, one was in uh, uh, <clears throat> Central City, Colorado. Uh, the other was in uh, Creston, Wyoming.